Welcome back to the lab. A few weeks back we designed the ideal diode controller and a buck converter that converts 24 volts down to 12 volts with 5 amps. Let's talk about that. First things first, what is an ideal diode? An ideal diode is a simple circuit that's made up of a MOSFET and a controller. The concept is really simple, but in practice things can get a little more complicated. A diode, the simple silicon diode, nothing fancy, will always have something known as a forward voltage drop. Depending on how much current is flowing through a particular diode and how the diode is constructed, the specific voltage dropped across that part might change a little bit. But there will always be a voltage drop, something larger than zero. And that's a problem because this voltage drop can limit the efficiency of a design if there's current flowing through it and voltage across it, it's dissipating power. An ideal diode controller takes the concept of a diode and improves it. By using a MOSFET to replace that diode and driving that MOSFET correctly, one can simulate the behavior of a diode while using the transistor's equivalent resistance property. This property is often referred to as RDS on, or the drain to source resistance. By enhancing an N-channel MOSFET, it's possible to achieve an ideal diode, something with an effective resistance of just 10 milliohms. Just, just thinking for a moment, 10 milliohms, 10 amps of current through it, that would only be 0.1 volts dropped across that ideal diode, and a power dissipation of one watt. That's not bad for a 10 amp load, and a lot better than the 0.7 volts typical for a silicon diode. Basically, we're using this ideal diode, we're using this type of device, an ideal diode controller, to allow for multiple redundant DC inputs. This will establish a primary DC input, typically supplied by mains, and a secondary DC input, which can be supplied by alternative energy, a redundant DC supply, or a supplemental backup battery to keep the system alive even after the primary battery is discharged. Keeping UPS communication alive might prove useful, but I don't know exactly what that would look like right now. I mean, it could be a web interface, USB, RS-45, all three, one of them, I don't know. I'm really just not sure right now, but what I do know is that I can imagine a world where keeping communication open during an extended power outage might be useful. Measuring the duration of a power outage is another possible use, though I don't know how useful that would really be. We recently did a live stream just a couple weeks back, and during this stream we assembled and tested this circuit. We tested this ideal diode and the 12 volt buck converter. For those who dialed in, this was a bit of a fight. We had a bit of a rough start with the UPS prototype, but found eventual success. The stream unfolded into a four hour jam session filled with laughter, tears, sweat, and blood. So basically it was fantastic. Assembly went on, business as usual. I was able to capture some awesome close-ups of the soldering process, which is awesome. Then of course, things started to do what things tend to do. They got a little sideways. So let's talk through that. Hurdle the first, turns out, Getting 10 amp rated barrel jacks in the standard 2.1 by 5.5 millimeter size is impossible. So our barrel jacks on the board are actually 2.5 by 5.5 millimeters, which is not the same, which means that some tack wires were required to get power into the board. Oops. Not to worry, Amazon to the rescue, but wait a minute. Actually, there's nothing available in the 2.5 by 5.5 millimeter barrel jack size. Well, at least no cables or power supplies that are worth talking about or recommending. We ended up settling for a couple of Y cables uh, because they exist. We'll use one of these to complete the testing of the ideal diode controllers. I couldn't feed one DC voltage into both inputs. And then we'll cannibalize the second one to get a supply hooked up. So yikes, that's not great. But it brings up a great point that we should be thinking about as we move forward. Whether or not 10 amps is truly required on these 24 volt inputs, and if they're not, if we can cut back that 10 amp requirement to six or so, then we could use the more common 2.1 by 5.5 millimeter connector size while reducing the cost of the AC to DC power supply as well. That is something to think about. That is something that we should keep in mind as we're finishing up the design. Thankfully, Everything was assembled pretty quickly and we were able to test the ideal diode controllers, see that the gate drive signals are behaving well. These ICs have what I presume to be a charge pump internal to them, which is necessary because we need to generate a gate drive voltage that's higher than the input voltage. In this case, we need a positive supply that can achieve at least 30 volts to bias the FET on above our 24 volt input voltage. Not a problem. Hurdle the second, the 12 volt buck. Yes, indeed, this power supply caused some headaches and the mistake was so simple. 
This IC implements a programmable cycle by cycle current limit through a pull down resistor on the low side gate to program what that voltage threshold is. Our design calls for a 100 kilo ohm resistor, which sets the peak current to an appropriate value. Unfortunately, we accidentally populated a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor in its place, leading to some pretty strange behavior. An inspection of the output appeared to be some kind of instability, but this theory was quickly proven wrong through inspection of the waveform present on the compensation pin or comp pin. It became obvious that some sort of internal protection circuit was being triggered. I saw a clearly sawtooth waveform on that comp pin, which would indicate some kind of repeatedly failing soft start routine. Oh, right, because that's what it was. This should have been a quick and simple debugging process, except for one small detail. I forgot all about the programmable current limit. <laughs> Ugh. See, usually this feeds into like a current sense pin and you have a shunt resistor, but this is so highly integrated because we're using the low side FET RDS on. I forgot the feature even existed. <laughs> Oops. After some collaborative debug in the comments, seriously, thank you guys. Sincere thank you to everyone who joined us in the stream, who was helping us out, reading through the data sheet. Awesome. Thank you so much. We tried a few debugging steps, but nothing was leading to a solution because we were forgetting about this thing. Nothing was working. I was getting a little frustrated and was ready to take this debug offline. I had to admit that this problem could be a design mistake, and I was ready to dive into the design and see where we went wrong. Thankfully, that wasn't necessary because our awesome community dove into the data sheet and reminded me of that current limit feature. Once that was discovered, the solution was simple. Just populate the correct 100 kilo ohm resistor on the board and... Oh, yeah, right. Uh, hurdle the third. In our excitement of seeing what appeared to be a stable power supply, I forgot to take the meter out of current mode and shorted the output of our 12 volt supply to ground. Oops. This quickly destroyed one of the FETs in our converter, back driving the gate drive pin of the microcontroller with 24 volts and destroying all the silicon in the supply. <sighs> okay. Break out the hot air gun, get some new parts on the board. Let's get this thing fired up, all right? It's been a long journey. We confirmed the design works. Finally, 12 volts as measured by our multimeter, spot on, 12.00 volts, nice. A quick load test confirms the supply is capable of supplying five amps. A brief overload test saw up to six amps, maybe six and a quarter, which is plenty for our UPS and that's Solid margin. Looks like we're in pretty great shape. The biggest takeaway or improvement opportunity that I noticed in our initial load testing is realizing that these FETs get very hot under full load, so using thermal vias to spread that heat across the multiple layers of the PCB and away from these parts will be a great idea. It's not always practical with a two layer board because we only have two layers of copper and one of them is the ground plane, but the final board will be at least four layers, so I took down a note to do this later. Thermal vias and a little airflow will take great care of these power supplies. All things considered, I think our first day of testing turned out pretty great. Sure, it took a little while. Maybe it was a little bit of a bumpy ride, but the design seems to work. If you like what you saw today and you can't wait for more like this, make sure you subscribe so you'll be notified of our future videos. We'll be adding two more power supplies to the mix, making line and load regulation measurements for the 5, 12, and 15 volt buck converters, and I'll try to sneak efficiency in there too. Also, if you want to support the channel, consider checking out the products that we featured today through our Amazon affiliate links in the description. It really helps us out a lot. If you think this prototype is awesome, let me know by hitting the like button on this video or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!